Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me welcome you at our debate, which is a part of Václav Havel European Dialogues. My name is Alice Nimcová Tejkalová. I'm head of the Department of Journalism of the Faculty of Social Sciences that is a partner of this debate, and I will be chairing this debate. The debate is organized by uh, the Václav Havel Library, Faculty of Social Sciences, and representation of the European Commission in the Czech Republic. Today, we have a very interesting and important topic, information and democracy, with two great speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, the Belarusian politician and main oppositional candidate in uh, 2020 Belarusian presidential elections, Svetlana Chichanovska, which we have here in the first row. And one of the top investigative journalists, not only in the Central Europe, but uh, in the worldwide perspective, Pavla Holcová, who is also here with us. Before uh, we will start the debate, I would like uh, to welcome here also our distinguished guests. The first one is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Tomáš Karasek, who will share... <laughs> We will share the opening remarks with us. Please, Tomáš, floor is yours. Thank you, Alice, for the introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. Uh, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you at uh, tonight's event, which uh, Charles University's Faculty of Social Sciences co-hosts, and uh, is very, very honored to, to be able to do so. So uh, many thanks also to the Václav Havel's Library for the invitation to uh, be a co-organizer of, uh, of this very interesting and stimulating event. Uh, the topic that uh, our Dear speakers, we'll be discussing uh, well concerned communication and information. And uh, it is indeed an essential topic uh, in many aspects of uh, social interactions. Uh, at the faculty, uh, we do have uh, a very important and robust uh, expert background on this. Uh, one of our five institutes is actually dedicated to the study of the media, communication, and journalism. But uh, with uh, the progress uh, of uh, social media and other means, uh, technological advanced means of communication, uh, I must confess uh, that communication has actually become a very important uh, and sometimes principal subject of studies across the faculty uh, in fields like sociology, political science, international relations, or security studies. While communication and information are ever present uh, and uh, sort of come uh, naturally as part of uh, human coexistence and social activities. I believe that what we dearly need uh, in the societies that we represent, so in democratic societies or societies uh, democratically governed, uh, we need uh, a dialogue. And uh, it is, of course, my great pleasure to be uh, able to introduce an event uh, which exemplifies the importance of dialogue in our social and political and academic life. Uh, while communication comes naturally, dialogue uh, is complicated uh, and it is selective. Uh, we do communicate and must communicate, uh, even with our enemies. Uh, and of course, uh, we do have uh, various kinds uh, and modes of communication. Even waging a war on one another can be considered an act of communication. A dialogue is something different. Uh, dialogue is offered. Uh, dialogue takes into account uh, the possibility that uh, we want to be influenced uh, by, what the, by the other speaker's opinions uh, and knowledge uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, ideas. And uh, that we also consider it important uh, for, the, uh, for the other party uh, to be treated as a partner or even friend. So uh, while uh, we cannot overestimate uh, the importance of communication uh, in the society and politics, I believe we should really strive for and uh, enhance uh, at every possibility that we have uh, dialogue between uh, the people who make up the society and, uh, and who represent it. So once again, it is my great pleasure to be able to welcome you uh, at an event uh, which uh, exemplifies and represents uh, the possibility of uh, bringing interesting and stimulating speakers uh, to uh, a dialogue among themselves and, uh, and with you in the audience. And uh, with this, uh, uh, let me welcome you once again and thank you for your attention. You. 
And now I've, I would like to kindly ask the director of the Václav Havel Library, Michal Žantovský, to join us also here at the podium. Good evening. Uh, Spectabilis, Dean Karasek, uh, our honorable guests, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Um, in his novel, a well-known novel, 1984, George Orwell left us a durable blueprint of totalitarian mindset and of its abuse of language to distort, manipulate, and pervert the truth. While the dystopian world of Orwell's novel may have read just like a dark metaphor even 10 years ago, it reads like a realistic description of the events and processes unfolding a few thousand kilometers east of Prague today. However unimpressive the performance of the Russian army in its aggression against Ukraine seems to have been so far, the weaponization of linguistic and semantic relativity by Russia, as evidenced in yesterday's Red Square speech by Vladimir Putin, has exceeded everything his infamous predecessors from Benito Mussolini through Joseph Goebbels to Joseph Stalin have been able to accomplish. In Putin's version of Orwell's Newspeak, aggression is defense. The Ukrainian defenders of their own country, including the descendants of the victims of Holodomor and Holocaust, are the Nazis. And the practitioners of the most barbaric form of nationalism since the Second World War are the liberators. War is peace, lie is truth, and hatred is love. The Ministry of Love, tasked with destroying every true instinct and inclination of people, the Ministry of Truth, tasked with making truth unrecognizable, the Ministry of Peace, tasked with waging war against other peoples, and the Ministry of Plenty, tasked with turning poverty into an everyday standard, are back again. What is particularly horrifying is Putin's success in instilling this mindset into a considerable portion of the Russian population and into large numbers of useful idiots elsewhere. It makes us aware that truth and the normal ways of sharing incontestable facts in a society are much more fragile than we would believe. It should make us more watchful and alert for signs of newspeak and truth relativism in our own midst. In keeping with the legacy of Václav Havel, it should also make us emphasize the crucial importance for, uh, of personal responsibility of each of us in vouching for truth with our names, our real names, our reputations, and if need be, even with our lives. Newspeak can only thrive in a society of anonymous wheelcocks fed drivel by the propagandists, the fabricators, and trolls of the regime. This is the issue at the core of the ninth edition of the Václav Havel European Dialogues, conducted in the Czech Republic and other European cities since 2014, and based on the conviction that Europe cannot be a comfortable home for all its citizens without a common space for discourse, dialogue, and diversity. For the first time this year, the dialogues are taking place not only in Prague, but also in Pilsen and in Brno. We are grateful to all our partners and sponsors who have helped us to make this expanded series of dialogues possible. First of all, the Vice President of the European Commission, Viera Jourova, the Czech Minister of European Affairs, Mikuláš Beck, and the Czech Minister of Culture, Martin Baxa, under whose collective auspices these dialogues are taking place. 
the representation of the European Commission in the Czech Republic, who have been our partners for many years now, the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Charles University, and thank you again, Dean Karasek and Dr. Nemcova Tejkalova, the Faculty of Education of the Best Bohemian University in Pilsen, and the Faculty of Social Studies of the Masaryk University in Brno. Thank you very much, all of you. And now I would like uh, to ask uh, our first speaker, Vice President of the European Commission, Viera Jourova, to address us. She couldn't be here in person because she needs to be in Brussels today, but uh, she recorded uh, her remarks. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to participate in this year's event, although I am sorry I cannot be with you in person. History has yet again accelerated. After COVID, we are faced with unprovoked aggression of Putin's Russia on Ukraine. In times like this, I think the world really needs leaders like Havel. A big picture of Havel hangs in my office and I consult him very often. I appreciate that this year you suggest discussing truth and democracy. Let me start from bringing one thought of Václav Havel from his first presidential address in 1990. He recalls the how on plane to Bratislava he had time to look out of the window and he said, the view was enough for me to understand that for decades our statesmen and political leaders did not look or did not want to look out of the windows of their planes. And this is to me a powerful reminder about the virtue of democratic politicians. It is our duty and obligation to look around talk to people and understand their situation, their concerns and their problems. And most of all, to be honest, not to paint the grass green, like authoritarian leaders like to do, but to tell the people the truth. So what do I see today when I talk to people in the Czech Republic and other European countries? First of all, I hear stories of a terrible war. I hear the story of Matev, an eight-year-old shot by Russians, together with his mother, Margarita, as they tried to escape the hell of Bucha. I also hear about the troubles here at home. A family is trying to cope with an energy bill that doubled since last year. An older lady double counting her change to make sure she can afford her usual groceries as food prices are increasing. All these are individual truths to the people facing challenges of every day. And democracy, if we want people to have faith in it and support it, must find answers to these challenges. I have expressed many times my conviction that the key ingredient of a democratic society is trust. Trust in one another, trust in the democratic institutions, trust that the state authorities are not there to oppress us, but to serve us. And this trust is eroded today for many reasons, both external and internal. If we want to fix this, we must start by being honest about it and also accept responsibility for this state of affairs. But I also see reasons for hope. Let me mention two of them. First of all, 
Europe has a new impetus and is acting both on the European and national level. Unity for biting sanctions against Russia, cooperation on energy security, enabling compensations for gas prices and promoting tax reductions on basic products. Also, national governments raising to the challenge, for instance, Czech government providing military help to Ukraine and support refugees. And a strong international alliance with partners such as US, but also G7 and beyond. The second reason for hope is a less obvious one. We already have what Ukrainians are fighting for. We have free and fair elections. We have peaceful transition of power. We can criticize our politicians and not go to jail for this. We have anti-corruption bodies and courts we can turn to. We, the people, can decide who we put in charge and who we want to get rid of in the parliament. This is the essence of democracy. And of course, not all those elements are perfect and they will never be. Our annual rule of law report shows the positives and areas for improvements in every country. Democracy is a journey. It will go. I have no doubts about it through stormy waters. The big question is if we use the calm weather to get ready for the storm. And in fact, this is the essence of my work in Brussels. In 2020, I have proposed a European Democracy Action Plan, a first of its kind plan to strengthen all elements of our democracies. It is about electoral resilience, support to the media, countering disinformation and promoting active civil society. And I would like to discuss with you one aspect of this plan, namely countering disinformation due to its strong relation with truth. In the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine, we see what disinformation can be used for. Putin uses it first to prepare the ground for the invasion and now to justify it. We hear about denazification, about special military operation, about security risk to Russia from Ukraine. And what we see now, while in pandemic, disinformation served as a poison. Byly dezinformace jedem, tak teď je dezinformace používána jako zbraň. Amplify this information. It is increasingly difficult to see who is saying what and why. Yet, new technologies should be tools for emancipation, not for manipulation. When I say this, some people argue or rather shout, Yorova, you want to censor the internet. So, let me repeat. Freedom of speech is the most cherished value of democracy. And I said many times, I do not want to see a ministry of truth. To bring in Václav Havel again, follow the man who seeks the truth. Run from the man who has found it. This is why our actions don't focus on assessing the content. It is about ending the Wild West and bringing rules to the online world. Rights need to be respected online as they are offline. Online platforms will have obligations and accountability. And we are opening up their black boxes. We have a new law, the Digital Services Act, and we are overhauling the anti-disinformation code. For instance, we are stopping platforms and websites from making money from disinformation. They must design 
and deliver better ways to deal with manipulation, bots and fake accounts. We are also enhancing the EU's and Member States' capacity to address foreign disinformation, developing new instruments that will allow for imposing costs on perpetrators. We must not stay idle when Russia's state-sponsored outlets, not media, spread war propaganda. This is why we have taken the unprecedented decision to sanction Sputnik and Russia today, two outlets that are the information arms of Putin's regime. And this brings me to the role of the media in democracy and in seeking the truth. Media are an essential pillar of democracy. Why? Because they are very good in discovering the lies, hence they help us to judge what is true and what is false. They are our eyes under Russian bombs and threats. They show us what Russia does not want us to see. Which is the underlying goal in all the actions I have just laid out to you? That citizens have the power to make informed decisions. And we will not leave the media without support. We are now preparing the Media Freedom Act that will enshrine, for the first time in EU law, common safeguards to protect media pluralism and the editorial independence of the media. Ladies and gentlemen, both truth and democracy can be very philosophical concepts. No one holds a monopoly for the truth. No one holds a monopoly for true democracy. But I am absolutely certain that democracy cannot exist without truth. And democracy is the best place for truth to flourish. I am also certain that for democracy to be successful, we need common values, like freedom of speech, independent courts and a free press. Without values, democracy will be like an empty shell that crumbles under the pressure from those who seek to weaken us. Therefore, I want to end this speech with an appeal to all of you. Democracy is not strong with the strengths of its leaders alone. Democracy is strong with the strengths of its people. We all have a role to play to uphold democratic principles and values, and I don't mean here only attending elections. It is also about the respect we have for political opponents or for those who disagree with us, both online and offline. Ladies and gentlemen, democracy is not given once and for all. It is on us to protect, to nourish, to change and adapt it. And I count on you that we can do it in truly democratic way. Thank you, Vice President Jourova. Thank you, Vera. And uh, now to our keynote speaker, a woman who came to symbolize the struggle for freedom and democracy in Belarus and in our part of Europe. By now, an old friend of the Václav Havel Library, if I may say so, Sviatlana Cichanovskaya became the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Movement after her husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, was arrested by the Lukashenko regime. And she ran in the 2020 Belarusian presidential election as the main opposition candidate. Before running for the presidency, Madame Tikhanovskaya was an English teacher and interpreter so that we not only share views on freedom and democracy, but also professions. Uh, so, Madame Cechanowska, Sviatlana.
So my dear Mikhail, <laughs> dear Dim Karashek, uh, dear Vice President uh, Vera Yurova, Pavla Khaltsova, uh, participants of Václav Havel European Dialogues. I really ashamed to admit this, but until 2020, I didn't know a lot about Václav Havel. Until 2020, I wasn't involved in politics, just as many other Belarusians. Of course, I followed the news, mostly on social networks. But it was always so far away, and I didn't feel that I was in power to change anything in our country. I think Havel couldn't stand people like myself before 2020. We were simply a political. Of course, later I realized my own responsibility for prolonging the dictatorship. In 2020, everything changed in Belarus. Revolution has started. My husband was imprisoned exactly two years ago. And I remember the moment when I suddenly faced the choice between standing up for my husband and retreating. I'm still surprised with myself. I didn't hesitate for a second. Politics came into my life at the very moment when I had to make a choice. Society matures when it becomes ready to make its choices, as I did then. We matured. Belarusians made a choice in 2020 in favor of democracy, human rights, and European future. And this choice is irreversible. Václav Havel's legacy came into my life with politics. I remember my first visit to Brussels. I was so worried, and uh, you know, one of my first meetings was a meeting with Vera Jurova. A large portrait of Václav Havel hung over her table. She then told me about Havel and what he means for Czechs. Later, I learned that Havel played an important role not only for Czechs, but also for Belarusians. He was perhaps the biggest advocate for Belarus political prisoners. I think if Havel had been here with us, he would have led the campaign for their release. Václav Havel's last letter was a letter to Belarusian political prisoners. And I'm eternally grateful to him for his stance. In 2020, many experts, politicians quoted Václav Havel when describing the events in Belarus, our peaceful way of struggle. He always believed in us, even when nobody did. It's spectacular that Václav Havel saw in Belarusians a potential that many of us didn't see or feel. Václav Havel was a big supporter of independent media. I just learned yesterday that one uh, he dedicated and donated one of his awards was to Nasha Niva, Belarusian Democratic Newspaper. This spring, two editors of Nasha Niva were sentenced to two and a half years of prison each. Another is still under prosecution. The staff managed to flee the country and are working from abroad now. It's Václav Havel who invited Radio Free Europe to come to Prague. The Belarus service of Radio Free Europe played a crucial role in the Belarus uprising in 2020. It conducted live streams from the rallies of Sergei, my husband, and they were watched by hundreds of thousands of people. Correspondents of Radio Free Europe chose to stay in Belarus even when amid the complete terror of 2021. It's not hard to guess where they are now. Oleg Rudilovich got one and a half year in prison. Radio Liberty consultant Igor Losik got 15 years of jail. If Havel were with us today, he would be proud of the courage of Belarusians. Of course, he would be proud for our peaceful protests. He would cheer the bravery demonstrated by Belarusians while supporting Ukraine. Belarusians disrupted railways, and soldiers refused to cross the border. 
Just think about it. More than 80 acts of sabotage on railways in two months. In part thanks to Belarusians, the Russian army gave up on plane to take Kiev. Who could imagine that after the terror of 2020 and 2021, such resistance could be possible at all? Belarusians refused the very idea of Russian revanchism. 86% of Belarusians claimed they were against Belarus taking part in this war. Despite heavy brainwashing and propaganda, we made our choice clear. And even uh, and when a like on Instagram or yellow and blue hair ribbon is enough to be imprisoned. Despite the repressions, many Belarusians couldn't stand back. And let me tell you one story. It is the story of 19-year-old Timur, who participated in protests in 2020. He was beaten by Lukashenko's tax after the elections and spent weeks in coma. His mother couldn't stand the shock and died while he was still unconscious. Timur survived and managed to flee to the Czech Republic. And I have to tell you, fleeing Belarus is a risky quest. People run through forests and swamps. When the war started, he joined the Belarus battalion of Kastus Kalinovsky and now defends Ukraine alongside Ukrainian soldiers. He believes that Ukraine victory could give him a chance to return to Belarus. Just like Timur, we understand that the fates of Belarusian and Ukrainian people are interdependent now. We in Belarus understand that there will be no free Belarus without free Ukraine. And without free Belarus, there will be no safe Ukraine. That's why, just like Timur, Belarusians are doing whatever they can to bring common peace and freedom for us all. Be it joining the ranks of Ukrainian defenders, reporting movement of military equipment, or donating the Ukrainian refugees. Both of our nations are striving to defend a shared future in a common European family. I believe Václav Havel was right when he insisted that Belarus belongs to European family. We are proving it with our actions. However, right now, as the new Iron Curtain falls down on Europe, we should make sure that Belarus ends up on the right side of the history. And just like Václav Havel was a visionary and a believer in democratic change, I urge you to become visionaries as well. I urge you to use your voice to advocate for our common freedom and future. I firmly agree with Havel when he said, nothing is more powerful than individuals acting out of their consciousness. In trying times like now, we should follow his advice. Thank you for your attention. We will divide the discussion into two parts. Uh, the first one will be uh, with uh, Mrs. Chikhanovska because she needs to leave uh, at seven o'clock. So uh, there's the possibility for you to uh, ask questions. If you don't have any at the beginning, uh, I have two for warming up and then I hope you will uh, have your own because I am sure that you came here for our interesting guests. Uh, so, do you have any questions in uh, the public? Just raise your hands if you want to ask. Yes, here is the first row and Peter will bring us the microphone. Okay, there will be micro lady. There, the gentleman in the first row. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Tomáš Koreň and I would like to ask 
Uh, very often it is uh, questioned whether Western politicians should give meetings to our opponents. For example, it might help dictators to improve their image. On the other hand, it can be crucial in terms of establishing contact and communicating crises. For example, this topic was often discussed in regards to Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un, but I believe it is also coming to import uh, in terms of the Russian crisis and in terms of negotiations with Putin. So do you believe it is beneficial uh, for Western politicians to give personal meetings to authoritarians? Look, every crisis uh, usually ends with negotiations, with dialogue. And even in Belarus, we want to get rid of the regime. We want to release all political prisoners. We want uh, this violence to be stopped. But we also understand that after our revolution, after this fight, after all our conditions will be fulfilled, the dialogue with the regime uh, will take place. And we, look, we, we want our revolution to finish peacefully. We don't want any, any pain, any, any blood in, in our country. We see Ukraine, we, you know, our hearts are bleeding for this country, but we want uh, everything to be finished peacefully. So that's why uh, negotiations are important, but it should be a proper moment for negotiation. So now, for example, uh, in Belarus, we are advocating for full political isolation of Lukashenko's regime. There is another Belarus, uh, free Belarus, independent and democratic, and it is, uh, this Belarus is represented by other people. So now it's high time to communicate with the other center of power, with people who, are, uh, who want changes in our country. So, no dialogue with Lukashenko and his cronies now. Now it's important to create multiple, multiple points of pressure on the regime for them to fulfill um, our demands, political prisons, repressions, withdrawal of Russian troops from, from Belarus, and only then negotiations, but not negotiations between Europe and Lukashenko's regime, negotiations between regime and Belarusian people. So, uh, it's important to talk, but in proper time. Thank you. Another question from the young lady just beside you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karolina Farska. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, how is your cooperation with the opposition from exile? Like, I can imagine that like it has to be really um, impossible for you to go to Belarus. However, it seems really impossible to like have a good cooperation and communication with the people fighting there. So um, this is my first question also regarding your security when you're out of Belarus. So I can imagine that I'm kind of scared for you being here and not being in Belarus, you know. And the second question is, how do you see the uh, the imposition of sanctions to Russia and also to uh, to Belarus regarding the war in Ukraine. And do you do you uh, somehow see the sanctions being more um, damaging to Belarus and maybe even also like uh, lowering the impact of the regime and also maybe supporting the opposition in the end? Or uh, do you see that it's just something which is functioning but not devastating for the Lukashenko regime? Look, in uh, our time, you know, it's absolutely possible to communicate with uh, people in Belarus, even if I'm in exile. So first of all, uh, COVID uh, uh, forced people to communicate uh, via Zoom, you know, through internet, and we continue this practice. I'm communicating with Belarusians on the ground almost every day with different groups of people, medics, sportsmen, workers, uh, mothers, uh, relatives of political prisoners, students, yeah, all the groups. And uh, uh, of course, uh, people who are on the ground have to um, take care about themselves. That's why our Zooms are rather closed, you know, and we don't invite many people uh, to this Zoom conference because there could be KGB people. So we are communicating to tr three or four people and then these three, four people, you know, communicating further in, in their groups. So it's not, 
this, this connection is absolutely necessary for, uh, for us to inspire each other. We, for example, I don't say people what to do. You know, you have to do this or that. People are telling me what it's possible to do on the ground, what's not possible, and we just coordinate in our actions. So we always in public. We are sending messages uh, to people uh, through media. People in Belarus know how to get access to alternative media. We are. Um, spread information through YouTube, Telegram channels, Instagram, TikTok, you know, we, uh, in difficult times, we have to be very creative. And, uh, you know, in Belarus, uh, so-called uh, Belarusian government declared all the alternative media as extremists. So it's uh, rather difficult to, you know, for people to watch everything, but people know how to use VPN, how to delete all the history. So we are uh, rather prepared for, uh, you know, for such situations. For example, war in Ukraine, we managed to give a real, a real a truth to Belarusian people after the war has started. So we have many means of communication with people, and uh, you know, we, oh, it's, it's not a problem right now. And uh, as for sanctions, we understand that sanctions is not a silver bullet for solving such crises as in, as in Belarus or in, this, in, in, in Russia and in, in Ukraine, but uh, it, it's impossible. You know, regimes, uh, dictatorships know, know, understand only the language of power. And, uh, you know, sanctions are maybe one of the most powerful leverages to create pressure on the regimes. Of course, in Russia, they have more possibilities to uh, survive a little bit longer uh, through sanctions. Um, but in Belarus, for example, it's uh, very difficult for Lukashenko to survive sanctions, and that's why it's important to, um, uh, to uh, impose uh, as much sanctions as possible, but on the state organizations. Because uh, in Belarus, all the uh, uh, state uh, enterprises, uh, they serve to, to regime. And we are asking to sanction regimes, institutions, but not to sanction private businesses, ordinary people, you know, to, uh, to create this pressure on, on state institutions. So I think, but, but sanctions have to be joined, of course. They have to be coordinated between European Union, the USA, Canada, I don't know, Australia, and so on, and only in this uh, way they will be effective. Because we are dealing with experienced regimes who know how to circumvent sanctions. They're using other countries, I don't know, um, false organizations to circumvent sanctions. And uh, so when the fulfillment of sanctions are followed by special mechanisms, so only in this case they will be um, fruitful. Can I say so? Okay. Efficient. They will be efficient. Thank you. Another question. If there isn't any, since our uh, debate is connected to the information and democracy, um, do you have any specific strategies how to protect the facts uh, against the distortion? how to uh, promote uh, the truthful information and uh, how to survive in uh, the disinformation flood? Look, I can speak on, on, on behalf of uh, Belarus. You know, in our country, everything was happening gradually and people had to start step by step how to um, fight with, um, uh, with propaganda. You know, when uh, our revolution has started, uh, regime, uh, started to ruin all the media in Belarus, all the alternative media. And one by one, uh, this media started to relocate to another countries and they restored the activities. So people knew uh, websites, people knew uh, the, so, uh, how to reach this information, they knew how to avoid um, restrictions. And uh, so we, for this year and a half, we managed to build uh, a stable um, media broadcast in Belarus. And uh, so, so regime, uh, of course, they are fighting with alternative media. As I said, they uh, declared all the alternative media as extremists. And even a person, if a person like post in Instagram or, um, I don't know, put uh, 
commented on Twitter or somewhere of so-called extremist uh, media, they could be detained for this. So people, as I said, no, we are using VPN, they delete history, they don't, li don't put likes, uh, comment under uh, different um, username. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but still, you know, they have access, and people. Uh, even uh, I have to say that uh, we understand that in Belarus there are places, maybe small villages, or, or people who don't know how to use internet. And uh, for this uh, time, we created a wide network of um, some so-called Samis that or self-made newspapers, and our volunteers wide wide spread about 400,000 copies every month to different parts of Belarus. So it's like old method, but it works when, uh, when the media are restricted. So uh, it's a little, little bit different situation with Russia because uh, I think it was a little bit unexpected for them when the media started to be ruined immediately, you know, like uh, Putin took example from Lukashenko. So they didn't have, have much time to prepare for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe in, in Russia, more uh, people believe to like TV set, they believe to propaganda. But in our case, uh, Belarusian people know how to how to uh, how to treat propaganda and where to take information. Thank you. We have the space for the last question to keep the minutes for your visit uh, straight. So uh, another question here. Just wait for the micro, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I was meaning to ask because actually I had the chance to uh, conduct some research about the situation in Belarus and it was very interesting to me because a lot of the protests it seemed, well some people were obviously protesting for democracy and liberal rights and so on, but actually a lot of the surveys, surveys that were conducted showed that a lot of people were um, protesting primarily because of terrible economic conditions and because of poverty and because of the decline of material standard in their lives. And it was very interesting to me because you said that the shift to the West in Belarus and democratization is inevitable. I am interesting what leads you to that conclusion because for example, even in 2020, a lot of the protesters themselves aligned themselves more as anti-Russian than necessarily pro-European or pro-liberal democracy, as, as far as the numbers that I have seen about the issue. Uh, so first of all, in Belarus there were no, never anti-Russian moods or pro-European moods. Like, uh, according to some polls, uh, in 2020, about 60% of Belarusian people voted for closer relationship with Russia. And the same 60% for closer relationship with the European countries. The fact is that nobody never asked Belarusian people, how do you want our country to develop? For 27 years, one person decided where we should go. That's why this uh, closer um, relationship with Russia was, was fulfilled. But in 2020, shift in mind, in understanding of the situation uh, came to, to Belarusian people. Of course, some people uh, went to rallies for democratization. Some people went against Lukashenko's regime. Some people went against uh, uh, lawlessness in our country. Many, many reasons, but the only thing people understood that our country in such position because of uh, poor management, because of uh, dictator in, in, in uh, the power. And uh, uh, so when we are talking about democratization, we so when we say democracy, in our understanding, it means uh, prosperity, it means safety, it means uh, rule of law. This is what about democratization. And uh, every person can, can understand democratization differently, but everybody. Now I have to say that uh, it, um, opinion about uh, Russia change, changed a lot among Belarusians. Because now Russia means war, disaster, 
poverty, uh, economic collapse possible, and Europe means, uh, as I say, uh, safety, safety. And people now fleeing the country, they are not going to Russia, they are going to, to Europe. And now people asking uh, the questions themselves, first of all, what do I want? Where should I go? And that's why the support of Lukashenko's regime is, is decreasing and decreasing. It was, uh, I don't know, 15, 18 percent in 2020, and now it's even less, especially after uh, he tracked our country into this, law, into this war. So everybody you know, chooses for himself what he wants to fight for or against uh, what. But it's, uh, what unites us, Belarusian people, is uh, the aim that we get, have to get rid of the regime. And only after this, we'll be able to build our future by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for your visit. Thank you. Uh, now, we will change the topic slightly, and I would like to welcome here uh, the investigative reporter Pavla Holtsova, and we will have the discussion in Czech, actually. Oh, Pavla, uh, there's the flower for you. <laughs> 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 Dear Pavla, I already said that you are one of the most interesting and best investigative journalists, not only in Central Europe, but in Europe as in general. We uh, studied together, we met while studying journalism, and my question is, why did you decide to choose a Czech Center for Investigative Journalism when someone might say that there were other centers, there was uh, the show Reporter Cheta and other shows, so why did you decide to create your own center? Well, I never actually wanted to create or found something myself. I just wanted to contribute in international projects and there was no one collaborating in international projects, in really big ones. There was no one like that. So I had to, I had to do this. You started contributing in international projects very actively. We already mentioned it at the beginning, but I think maybe it is good to say it again. You have many international awards. You were part of an international consortium that received the Pulitzer Prize, which is one of the most prestigious ones. So why did you choose such big investigative projects instead of remaining in the borders of the Czech Republic? Why did you decide to move on? Well, I was always interested in organized crime and corruption. And the data in this topic do not respect borders. So often you need to look for the most important data abroad. It is unimaginable for me to think of a politician who has a company, a corrupt company, and then stores the money in one country. I don't think this is often the case. Organized crime is not national or regional. Our topic today is information and democracy. So, to what extent you see 
organized campaigns when you investigate different causes and affairs? And is it easy to find about them? Well, yes, there are such campaigns. Generally, when we reach data about such things, we try to first fact-check them and look at the motivation of our source who gave us such data. And only then do we actually start working on a project. Because I think that basically any journalists fear that they may, may, might become part of a political game just because someone offers them selective data and then they vouch for those data with their names without actually looking at the full picture. I think this happens anywhere in the world and I'm happy to say that we haven't had this experience yet. You work on topics or affairs that are, that are often tough, even hideous. You try to disentangle things that most of us don't want to even imagine. Sometimes you are not successful. Sometimes you have very concrete results, like, for example, your work with Sasha Svetkovska, for which you were awarded a prize. And then, when you make these discoveries, this can lead to very concrete events, for example, the fall of a government. Sometimes when you discover something and publish it, still the protagonist may still run free and come back to an office. How do you face this? Well, I think this is like 95% of our cases. We don't write about those cases to put people in prison or to make the government fall. I think maybe the popular belief is that a journalist wakes up in the morning and thinks, okay, who am I going to shoot down today? But that's not the reality. We are just observers in the first place. We are not people who shape reality, who bring about things. Often we learn at school that we create a first draft of the history, but we shouldn't be part of it. Although there are cases that touch or involve us personally, for example, the murder of Jan Kuciak in Slovakia, that was a case when it was impossible to remain impartial. But I don't think that our major goal is to be involved, but to provide information to people so that they can decide for themselves based on facts. This is our role. <laughs> and it is easier to handle frustration with this approach. Okay, now we have room for your questions, questions from the audience. I see a hand and the microphone is coming. Good evening. Investigative journalism is a field for seasoned journalists who already have some experience of checking information and so on. And my question to both of you because we are now within academia, is what do you think about your current students, young journalists who enter your studies? Can they already see some issues, some controversies regarding the data and the information they receive? What is the current situation of journalism? They are great. I am really amazed. I am very excited about young journalists. 
And this is a great source of hope for me. We have people doing internships and generally when I look at them, I'm impressed. And also I say to myself, if I had this opportunity, maybe I would be doing something completely different in my life. Maybe I would learn very quickly that this is very complicated, but they can handle it, they can cope with it, and I'm really excited. Yeah, I do agree for quite a big percentage of students in every year. For example, I have a student who is working with Pavla and I teach her in one of our subjects and a big part of our students is very well prepared. And this was always the case. You always have one part of the year who are really ambitious, who want to do journalism, who want to do investigative journalism, although it is dangerous. And generally, when parents hear it, they are a little bit reluctant. Some students back away from this investigative journalism because it is not for anyone. And for example, Pavla recently posted an interview with a documentarist. No, please don't say this, please don't say this. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to speak about how difficult this field is. Just forget I said anything. But yes, investigative journalism is demanding and complicated. However, we also have part of our students who are influenced by COVID and they didn't really start interacting with others because of it. I had a colleague who was stressed because it was his first time interviewing someone in person and it might take some time before students will adapt to this again. Also, it has to do with the reputation of media today, which is influenced by politicians such as Miloš Zeman, but also Miroslav Kalousek, Mirek Topolánek and other influencers. The list is really long. Andrej Babiš, not to forget the most important ones. People who blame their troubles on media. And they have been building a very ugly image of journalism for quite some time. And often when we have entrance exams, we have students who tell us that they are there, although their parents didn't want them to go. They wanted a profession of which they could be proud of. And that was not journalism for them. So this is something we need to overcome and we need to appreciate students when they do it. I see another question in the first row. Yeah, please do have questions because we have a lot of time. So we welcome any questions. Thank you for the floor. Maybe I would like to pick up on what was said. We often see that media are politicized. Maybe thanks to the standard of the Czech television, it is not so often the case in the Czech Republic, but it is, for example, visible in the US. And then the truth starts to be seen as political opinion. So I wonder, in terms of international projects, how do you approach this? How do you work with this? For example, in the case of Panama Papers, many people had the prejudice that this was just an international group of journalists, and that was it. So what's your perspective and what's the perspective in the West towards international journalist collectives? Are they more credible? And also, given that you spent a majority of your life looking at corruption and at people who attack journalists because it is in their interest, what can you do to avoid your job being politicized and attacked? I will be speaking 
First of all, on behalf of the Czech Republic, I think that our work, the work of journalists, can be politicized by means of interpretations, but when you read any text that we publish, I don't think that you would be able to tell who we vote for. This is our goal. We are not friends with politicians. We don't go have a beer with politicians. We don't lead intimate conversations with them. And this also goes for international investigative centers. On our websites, we have no commentaries, no opinion section. So we try to keep this investigative to such extent as possible. And most of the investigative centers I work with has the same principles. For example, in the case of the New York Times, you probably can tell who they sympathize with, but it is more in terms of the opinion section and other sections. But we don't do this. I hope, at least. Uh, haven't I forgot about something? Yeah, maybe if you could co compare and contrast the um, view on journalists across the world, I think it's quite the same everywhere. Michal Žantovský has a question. I just hope that you are not appalled by the idea that you need to fulfill the 40 minutes of the discussions. Uh, don't you worry, I think that many people are really interested in your job. I have two questions to begin with. The first one pick up on what you've just said, especially with uh, the big American media. It was a commonplace for them to be neutral, to be politically independent. Even though with some media, such as the New York Times, you could tell their political inclination. And I'm, I'm not talking about opeds here uh, and commentaries where it is clear, of course, that there is an opinion expressed and a political inclination insinuated. But other than that, in American newspaper, Pieces are only politicized when expressing support for presidential candidates for one or the other. Or at least this neutrality used to be the case, and I think it's um, becoming less obvious, especially with TV channels such as uh, Fox News on the right or CNN on the left. In news reporting, we can really tell uh, that media are politicized and certain opinions are criticized and labeled as false. And I think this is a clear tendency, a clear trend. I wonder whether you can agree with me. What's your take on this? That would be the first question. And the second now, it is also linked to our view and understanding of media here and in the US. Viera Jourova presented in her video speech the proposed legislative measures aimed at regulating media, aimed at uh, making them accountable 
especially in the online world, for the content that they spread. In the US, uh, this will be quite difficult to push through, given uh, the amendments to the US Constitution. It will be quite politically challenging. So, what do you think about this? To your first question, I do agree with this trend. I'm not concerned, though. I think it's just a short-term trend that will disappear. And the second question, I can't really answer that, because I'm really happy to be an investigative journalist, which means that I do not have to focus on how online content should or should not be regulated, uh, what is good, what is already harmful, what's uh, in the gray area. I wouldn't really dare assessing, because Generally, I am not in favor of regulation. I think that people have the right to disinformation as far as they're labeled as disinformation and not as the truth. So I'm just happy that this is not in this is not up to me to decide. It's not up to me to decide about these regulating measures. In some cases, you will be concerned with uh, privacy protection and reputation protection, which is a very strong institute in the UK, for example. Well, I must say that I'm so happy the UK left the EU. It's the biggest advantage that I can't be brought before court in London. Because I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the slip law, slip lawsuits, this concept, where in Britain, when you're brought before court for defamation, the costs are borne by both sides and uh, the case is interpreted by the judge. Uh, your piece in question is interpreted by the judge himself. So it can so happen that a judge reads your text and based on his reading of the text, the judge believes that you write about a corrupt politician, even though there is no word of corruption or corrupt, you can be sentenced. So you think that you mentioned the Azerbaijan politicians and many of them are corrupt? Many of them are corrupt and believe it or not, I was, uh, I was uh, brought before court because of saying that. Okay, you were brought before court, but you also received one of the awards, uh, Global Shining Light Award for that piece. So it's also a, it's, there's a silver lining. This is a very good and current topic that we now are talking about. You currently uh, are being attacked by the surroundings of Andrei Babish with memes claiming that you want to end his career. How do you feel about that? Well, frankly, I could live without that. You said that similar things are more common in the East than in the West. Politicians target journalists systematically. Politicians target women more, more than men in the public arena. They are attacked uh, much more often. So what's your way of uh, defending yourself against these? 
I just want to say that it happens all across the world, in the US and elsewhere, in Norway. One thing is that Andrei Babish publishes a meme with my picture, but that's not that dangerous. What is more dangerous is what happens afterwards. Social media tweets, emails, letters, written letters, written correspondence that I receive in my post box, anonymous letters, which can be quite rough, really, of um, people claiming that um, I'm a swine and that I will end in hell and that I should be raped. You can defend yourself against this, you can try to cope with that, but uh, of course this stress accumulates and my way of dealing is, it's, it's jogging actually. Thank you for the floor. I hope I have a question, I hope it will be a question. I first wanted to thank Michal Jantovsky for his uh, introductory speech. And it seems that in the first speech you said that Putin, Putin is a liar. And we should emphasize that even in this talk. We should say that aloud because people are indifferent, including journalists. And journalists has, have to take a stance. They have to claim clearly where they are standing. Because this fragmentation of stances is quite dangerous. And with a pinch of exaggeration, our freedom is at stake now. And I think that the Czech Republic is also uh, to blame for not taking an active stance. It's not up to us, the general public, to take a stance. Journalists, they have the platform, they have the platform to do that. And I think that journalists are the best place to do that because we distrust our politicians, so we don't want to focus or rely on them. So for me, journalists are really the main actors. You should not only claim your facts, but also your opinions. Would you like to respond? I would. Or I would not. All right. So one more question. First of all, sorry for my imperfect check. Mr. Jantovsky talked about CNN and politicization in the US. I was brought up in the US and I admired Kamel Winter, one of the former reporters of the Radio Free Europe, a chief of uh, news reporting uh, in the Czech TV. And I think that he would be terribly disappointed by the current US media landscape. It is almost impossible to watch a neutral piece, a neutral news item um, on American media. And I think that American media has lost its uh, trustworthiness completely. And I think that the situation is much better here in the Czech Republic. As for disinformation, my wife died because of uh, disinformation. She was a lawyer by profession, by background, also a translator. 
and she believes in this stuff. So she, I correct myself, she hasn't died, but I lost her, I lost her, and she still lives. But now she completely relies on disinformation media. She follows these labels of media and she really is deceived by this disinformation media outlet. So my question is, how can we deal with that? Uh, how can we avoid uh, people falling to the trap of disinformation just like my wife did? I think this question would be better answered by an expert in this field, which I'm not. I think it is quite a complex issue. It's first very important to show that we verify information, that we actively build trust with our readers. And then we also need to persuade people who simply do not read. How 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 can we work with people who work who read just news titles that's a million dollar question what we do is that we work with social media one colleague of ours is in charge of them when a offensive an offensive comment appears she responds to that actively and she tries to link a dialogue with these uh, internet users. Sometimes some of them change their opinion, admit their fault, but the majority of them, they just stick to their opinion, even if, do, even if you present evidence. There are people who simply believe that there is conspiracy everywhere and that conspiracy is the answer to their unhappy lives. So you can't really deal with that. We had another question in the first row. I saw your hand, so I noticed. Okay, the floor is yours. Please wait for the microphone. My question regards the protection of journalists, which is tied with investigative journalists or with other sensitive topics. Some journalists maybe don't even have to deal with this. And I must admit that I don't know what the situation is like in the Czech Republic. In Slovakia, this is a huge topic since the murder of Jan Kuciak, and we said that we needed legislation to regulate this, but nothing happened so far. So what is the situation like in the Czech Republic? Do you think you have enough protection? Or if not, how could you define it in terms of law? One thing is the physical security, but also there is your image, your visibility, other forms of attacks. So what is your take on that? What are the challenges? Well, I was able to see how protection of journalists works in the Czech Republic, specifically after the murder of Jan Kutsa, because I got my own bodyguards and it worked very well. But without that murder, I don't know what would happen. We do see blackmailing and I don't think there is any methodology on how to evaluate them, whether there are 
spelling errors, grammar errors, the number of paragraphs, I don't know. I don't know if there is such a methodology. But I think it is naive for the journalists to just rely on the protection from the state. First of all, they need to protect themselves because they know best what work they are doing and what are the risks. If they want to held the state accountable for everything, they would have to share everything with the state so that it can be evaluated what are the risks. And I doubt that this can be done. I think it would be wrong. And of course, it takes some time before the states decide that you need protection. And this time can be of crucial importance. It's difficult for me to imagine that. Maybe that's the problem, that only after many years we started to see journalists actually dying in Europe. But what can be done about this? The society doesn't see this properly. We are bombarded by voices saying that journalists are enemies of the state. And now should we just rely on the civil society or should we try to count on enough critical thinking? So maybe this is just an extra question to this. I know it's very difficult to answer it. I think you are right. We need to count on the support of the civil society. And thank you for that to Slovakia. By the way, we have here with us Karolina from Slušné, Slovensko, just Slovakia. So really kudos for what you are doing for your protests after Martina Kušnirova and Jan Kuciak's murder. It was thanks to your pressure that things were looked at, that the prosecutor was questioned and replaced, and it wouldn't happen without you. Maybe people would just think that it isn't worth trying to change this. Because journalists just write about culture and sport, they have no real impact. This was the moment when people realized it did. The society did see the role of our work. And they saw that it was worth it spreading information. Information that can cost people lives. Sometimes the value of information can really be a human's life. We saw that in Slovakia, in the Netherlands, in Malta, or in Bulgaria. And we often count on the civil society to protect us, to speak up. By the way, this is why a Kochner's library project was initiated. We managed to access data based on which we decided to finish the work on all the cases Jan Kuciak was working on. Because we knew that the aim of this murder was to stop, to prevent journalists from speaking up. And we didn't want this to happen. And thanks to the huge support from civil society, from people who went to the streets and protested, and also thanks to the fact that Jan Kuciak shared information about different cases with me and my colleagues, we had a shared Google disk. We were able to continue the work.
And Slovakia had a huge opportunity for a change for the better. And it is not clear whether they will seize this opportunity. Okay, we have another question. Thank you. You already mentioned that this was not your, your job description, but still, I wonder that many people don't believe in journalism today. It can be politicians or other people. It is about values too, but it is also about people distrusting leaders. They think that leaders or the establishment is not accessible enough, is not open enough towards the general public. So I wonder whether you, when you do your job properly in terms of methodology, whether you think that this is enough? You as an investigative journalist did enough or whether you see a societal responsibility and I don't mean decreasing the quality of your text, but maybe trying to make the news more accessible to people, maybe considering what language you choose, whether it's too complex, whether it is accessible. So how you can get closer to the general public and whether you think that you actually should be doing this or whether people should be just encouraged to read quality investigative stories. Well, there is a rule that we try to apply. Which is that the text needs to be understandable for a 12 year old. But we don't go below that. So we either think of this 12 year old or of a granny, and we really try to make the article understandable for people who know nothing about the topic. We try to use simple language not to exhibit our specific terms and our expertise. But of course, it is a process in which we constantly learn. We also need to be accountable for what we write. So we need not oversimplify things. A couple of years ago, when there was a complicated financial transaction, we felt that we needed to name all the entities and countries involved. But now we know that the journalist needs to know that. But in the article, we just say there was a complex financial transaction, full stop. And if we can't resist, and if we really want to mention the entities involved, we just put that into a graph or into a figure. Okay. Maybe there is a topic that is discussed by different experts, so you cannot answer it for yourself, but what do you as a journalist think that is the source of the indifference towards media? Why do people still vote for Babish, although the news is published about him? Did you have the opportunity to speak to those people in person? What do you think makes those people indifferent to what you write? Well, they are not indifferent, but they think that everyone steals and they prefer to vote for someone they know who may be steals, but not to vote for someone they don't know and who is a thief too. It's just making their lives simpler. <laughs> in this context, in the context of getting 
receiving information. You said that you don't meet politicians in pubs, but you need to be informed, right? You need to get your information, even from politicians. Can you speak about this or is this top secret? Why should we try to gather information from politicians directly? Well, when they are involved in a case? Okay. If there is an affair involving a politician, an affair we write about, we need to give them the floor or the opportunity to speak about it. Sometimes they do want to speak about it, express their opinion, they tell us uh, it was something completely else, this didn't happen, or there was the other case with Andrei Babiš. We were preparing uh, an article on Pandora Papers and we were collaborating on this with 16 media in the world and we tried to send the article to him in advance. His press department told us that they were working on it, but they didn't respond. We sent it again and told them that we needed a response by a certain date, but the only result was that all the media collaborating on this topic were not led to the press conference with Viktor Orban. So we sent there our colleague, Hanka Chapova, to speak to Andrei Babiš when he was getting out of the car. She tried to do so, but they just pushed her away. We tried again at another press conference in Prunerov. Hanka was very close to the Prime Minister Andrei Babiš at the time. She again tried to ask her question and again she was ignored. Andrei Babiš left in car and she was shouted at by bodyguards. So he did have this opportunity, but he didn't seize it. What is more interesting, BBC also tried the same approach and their journalist also collaborating on this case was again pushed away and he was even attacked by the bodyguard, which created a scandal in BBC. They were really surprised to see what is possible here in the Czech Republic. So yes, we tried to give them the opportunity to speak when they are involved. Okay, and when you have cases from political environment, for example, in the case of Jan Kuciak, he was mostly working on political topics. And then you need to get inside information. How do you gather it? Can you gather it elsewhere than from politicians themselves? I do not recall gathering information about political, about a political environment. Our sources uh, were from the State Prosecutor's Office, the police, but not politicians. We didn't need to interview politicians. I ask that deliberately and I stick to this qu that question because there are some political reporters and when they talk to our students they repeat this one thing uh, they say that to be a good political journalist to be um, able to write good news reporting you need information and you need to get them from politicians and they say that then they have ties with politicians and it is very difficult then to uh, keep them professional. So is it uh, to protect yourself that you avoid 
talking with politicians? I think there are two main attitudes, two extreme attitudes. One would be talking actively with politicians to be uh, to stay abreast of what's happening. The second is, as a journalist, I won't even vote for any political parties because then I would be influenced. And then you have a whole spectrum of attitudes in between. Uh, that could be a topic for another interesting discussion. We, our organization, is leaning more towards the strictly apolitical stance, uh, not going even vote. Do you vote? I do. But in the last general election, I abstained. All right, thank you for your answer. Mr. Jantovsky. Uh, one question to make things a bit more difficult for you. Uh, a typical question about the ethics of your profession. As an investigative journalist, you surely can access information directly proving that there was crime or that there will be crime or that there is a risk of danger, of imminent danger for somebody. How do you deal with uh, such information? How should such information be dealt with ideally? I admit that we really lag behind in this aspect because we report on past events that are quite likely to replicate themselves in the future, but our articles focus on the past when writing about drug cartel importing tons of cocaine to Europe, there is there chances are that they will repeat it again and again in the future. But we do not predict, we do not know that in the given container, the given day, there will be the given amount or a given amount of cocaine. We do not have access to to such details. And I think this is a real drawback of uh, investigative journalism, because we only focus on the past events and we really can't write about the possible scenarios in the future. And that's something we'd like to change, we'd like to focus on in the future, specifically with cyber crime and trends in cyber crime. We would like to understand better these changes and describe these new patterns to be able to at least partially predict what is about to happen, which doesn't necessarily mean that we will know uh, what will happen, but at least we would be able to understand what is happening now. I have one more for you. You are a journalist, so you surely can imagine a situation a hypothetical situation like that, that you access, that you have access to such uh, information. So tell me, really, how would you deal with it? Would you protect your sources or would you act as a citizen? I can't tell generally. Say I'm approached by a person laundering money for the Russian regime and tells me specifically how they do that, I wouldn't approach the Russian fiscal authorities divulging that information because I would mistrust uh, these authorities uh, since they would very plausibly be involved in that uh, whole process. But on the other hand, say they would be there would be um, a plant crime and not economic crime, but real crime which could potentially result in 
harm or violence to people. And if it happens in a country where I trust, which I trust, I would go and inform them about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your questions. And since I, since I see Mr. Zhatovsky approaching, I think that our time's up. And it is. Um, it's five to eight. And we will give uh, the floor to Mr. Zhatovsky for his closing remarks. Before we do that, many thanks to our colleagues from the faculty and also from the Václav Havel Library, uh, who are among you and not here in front, but they did great job, so many thanks. Thank you. I actually have no closing remarks. I just want to express my immense gratitude that we gathered here, that we discussed here with uh, two very interesting person, very interesting women in person and one online that we could hear about their insights and opinions about truth and democracy. It is a precious moment, really. This debate uh, is ongoing, never-ending, but it tends to take place online, on social media and elsewhere online. And it's quite not the same, not the same as being here. And that's what I tried to emphasize in my introductory speech. We should safeguard this platform for people with real names and real faces and names such as uh, Pavla and Alice and Karolina and all of you here for these people to gather and share, share their opinion, their perception on specific topics. For quite some time I've had this strange idea, and I hope I won't sound as a conspirationist, but I feel that there seem to be two distinct worlds. One involving us, me and you, and then the world of shades or shadows. And these shadows, some of them maybe are human, but more of them are rather trolls and bots. Some of them are people with different faces and different names than they claim. And I think that it does us really much harm that we communicate with this second world. Of course, I'm a huge proponent of the freedom of speech, so I really have no intention to restrict it, restrict communication. But I would prefer these shadows communicating among themselves and us people communicating with one another. And we can leave them, leave them having their strange communication, but they should not meddle in our world. And I would really like to come up with some specific ways to do that. We've heard interesting ideas from Alice Pavla and Sviatlana. Really insightful. It gives me some more food for thought. I will continue reflecting on them and I also invite you to continue reflecting on these topics and talking about these topics. If you want to do that, the Václav Havel Library organizes roughly a total of 200 uh, discussions. We hold them on site and then stream them online on the Havel channel on YouTube. Now, just many thanks and have a nice evening.